Well, it's been a good day in the house of the Lord, hasn't it? Um, we've gotten some great rest um, this afternoon, spending some time with the Whitmans. And um, uh, my kids were able to have some fun getting some uh, peaches and uh, what was it? The sweet peas or whatever they call it? Snap peas and picking up some eggs. Now my kids want to farm. Um, <laughs> but it's a blessing. It's a blessing. Thank you, sister. Thank you to your husband also for putting us up and... Uh, this afternoon, thank you for the rest that uh, we were able to have. Also, um, Brother Matthew, thank you. Where did he go? Where is he at? Thank you so much for that, my brother. I thank you. Um, smile on your face and a heart for the Lord. It means a lot. It means a lot. Um, yeah, the small things are big things in the eyes of the Lord, aren't they? And uh, a, a child that has a heart for the Lord is something fantastic. You know, a child that had the heart for the Lord was the one that gave up his lunch there were a few 5,000 people. Unfortunately, we don't see a grown-up doing that, do we? The thing is, is that sometimes a, child, a child's faith is the example to uh, an adult for, to have a childlike faith, isn't it? The Bible clearly says that we have to have a childlike faith in order to get saved. And so, thank you so much for that, brother. That, that means a lot. Um, but I do want to point out, I want to say something this morning, and I totally forgot about it, and I, and I, I asked for forgiveness. But uh, about two months ago, this church gave an extra love offering uh, for us. It was about $1,600, and um, that meant a lot. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That helped us to uh, actually start uh, our, our, um, our uh, what is it called, our fund, um, start off, uh, start off fund. So we were able to put that away in order for us to um, be able to put that down, Lord willing, for a house in the future. So I thank you so much for um, the, the, the heart of this church and the people that give to missions and that go above and beyond. It is not overlooked. We thank you so much uh, for that. I wanted to say that in person. We were going to write a thank you note, but I wanted to, since I knew we were coming, I just wanted to say face to face, thank you so much for your heart for missions. It means, it means a lot. And Every cent, every penny that is given um, is not in vain. It is used for the work of the Lord, and we are so grateful for that. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, church. But um, let's go ahead and get into the, the Word of the Lord tonight, and then we're going to open up our Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. We're not going to talk about missions tonight, um, even though uh, I believe missions is a very, very important topic. Um, a, a pastor said this past week, and I've heard it throughout my life uh, growing up, they said that uh, God had a son, and his only son, God made him into a missionary. If you look at that, Jesus Christ left heaven above and came down to earth in order to um, save uh, the human race uh, from its sins. And um, that's, it's, it's a privilege to be a missionary, but um, there's more in the Bible than just missions. But even though missions should be one of our main focuses, it should be about like we talked about the battle for the souls of men, and we should keep that in our forefront because we have a great commission that's in front of us, but there are several different topics that we can talk about in the Bible. There's several different things for spiritual growth, for um, just uh, um, giving, and all these different things that are in the Bible. Um, but tonight, I just want to kind of share something that was on my heart that God gave me uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, uh, as uh, I flew down to Dallas for a meeting, I was down there for a conference and then uh, was there for an ordination. And I didn't have my family with me. I was kind of a last minute trip. I was invited the week previous. And so I just flew down. And, and um, yeah, after I got out with the conference, I'm sitting at the hotel. And when you don't have your, your wife or your children around you, you don't know what to do. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there, and I'm like, I got to do something. I can't work on my house because my house is way too far away. So I'm just like, what better way to study the Bible? And so I just sat down and started studying. And, and um, I, I don't know about you, but there are certain passages that you memorize throughout Scripture, uh, throughout your life, and just about of Scripture, and you just come back to those passages every once in a while, and you're just like, let me see if I can find something new in here. And the Bible is is a... Uh, a living book, and so you can go back to it uh, every single time and you find something new. I didn't realize that that was in there. That's a new perspective I've never seen. Oh, wow, that's a different application. All this different stuff. And that's what happened to me when I was down in Texas. And so um, this is only the second time that I've preached this message, and I, I just wanted to share this because this, this comes from the bottom of my heart. And 
The Lord gave it to me, I believe, for my personal growth, but I just want to share this with you tonight. Um, Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, let's all stand. We're going to start in the verse 4. It says, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, And there, and, and sorry, and these are the generations of the heavens and of the earth <clears throat> when they were created in the days that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is ple uh, pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Um, this, is, this is basically the beginning. Well, we saw the beginning of creation. This is um, just a, a, a deeper uh, explanation of what the Lord did when he formed man and when he created the Garden of Eden. But there's something in here that grabbed my attention, and I didn't realize this until I was uh, just going back and just sitting down and studying. And um, the Lord just really started pointing out just little nuggets here and there to me, and then I kind of started chasing those nuggets and, you know, comparing Scripture upon Scripture. And um, I got very excited, and I got kind of just... Uh, into the study mode, and, and I just want to share that with you tonight. And the title and the subject we're going to talk about is A Basic Lesson from the Trees. Um, you know, I don't know how many of you studied trees or if you like hugging trees or whatever. Uh, we can all learn a lesson from a tree, and I just want to share that with you tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you now, and we're so grateful to be in your house again. Uh, what an exciting day we've had, Father God, to hear what's going on with the the uh, missions team down at BIM, my God, uh, getting prepared for uh, the different uh, uh, events coming up this week. And, and uh, God, I'm so excited for a church that has a heart to serve missionaries. Um, Father God, I'm very humbled to be behind this pulpit in order to share your word to servants of servants. And God, I'm so grateful for that. God, I ask right now that you would just please fill me with your Holy Spirit, that you would be the one that speaks to hearts, that not be me, Father God, that preaches tonight. But Father God, that it would be you. Speak to my heart, Father God, allow me to ponder on your word and uh, speak to all of us in this room. That you would be our guest of honor, Father God, and that we would give you full honor and glory. And God, that we would leave out of here pleasing you and different and motivated to do what you want us to do, Father God. And uh, that we would seek your face, Father. That um, Brian would be changed because of this church, Father God. That uh, we would just make a difference and an impact in this world. God, we give you just the honor and glory. And we're grateful for who you are. And we ask all this in your precious holy name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, we all understand that uh, God created the Garden of Eden, and if you look into on how he created it and kind of what was inside of the garden, uh, we kind of learned this in, 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 in junior church, and we learned this in Sunday school when you're growing up in church, and we all have this kind of, um, kind of utopia sort of idea of what the Garden of Eden was like, and I truly, in the bottom of my heart, I truly believe it was a utopia. Because God doesn't make things just to make them. He makes them for a purpose, and he makes them perfect. 
And when you think about God creating the whole entire world and the heavens, and then he created man, created the animals, and placed man inside of this garden, I think every every creature and every human inside of us, ever since this utopia, this this Garden of Eden, was re, we were removed from it, we have all tried to kind of get back to it. We tried to get back to that peace and walking in the midst of a garden. And that's why people are, you know, love walking through forests and sitting by a river and, and being able to um, go out and hunt and all these different things that, that comes along with nature. I don't know if you like to garden, but... Um, I know that it's just, it's just kind of in human nature to be around plants and just to kind of, I don't want to say this in a weird way, but almost be one with it, But because we're a part of creation. And if you go out and you study it, it's kind of crazy because if you think about just the, in a basic way, God's haven on earth was a garden. For you and I. Isn't it crazy when you start thinking on how far removed away we are from a garden? We are in a building that's separated from basically nature. And it's crazy because the, the difference between what God's plan is and what the devil and what when we fall into sin or what the devil has basically absorbed humanity into It's kind of crazy on how different the things are. So the utopia, the perfect setting for man, was inside of a garden around nature. I don't know. I've I've heard in the past few months and stuff like that. Just I don't know if it's true or whatever. I don't know if you've seen it on Facebook or Instagram or whatever. But just the natural gravity pull or just being grounded, you know, being barefoot on the ground and how much that helps a human being, a balance out just everything that's going on in it. It's crazy that we use shoes and that separates us from these things. It's crazy on, on how, um, how we start eating processed foods that are not organic. And the way God had things for us was everything was planted and grown and harvested and eaten just like that. Now we put pesticides, and all those different things that just, if you just think about it on how modernization sometimes removes us from the real thing that God has created for us. I'm sorry, but Kraft macaroni and cheese is not food. (laughs) But in reality, it's good. You know, I'm a Baptist. I eat food. Um, But it's kind of removed on what we should be doing. And... um, but we can see that the reality is God's perfect setting for man was in a garden in the midst of creation. Why? Because creation screams that God is real. That God loves us. Creation screams that there's a purpose and a plan for everything. If you go and you start studying out on just photosynthesis, and you go study out on the oxygen, how, how our carbon monoxide is turned into oxygen for us. So you just go study outside all those molecular things. It starts getting crazy. But it shows the handprint of God into creation. Pretty humbling if you really start thinking about it. But you understand that everything is for a purpose. There's nothing that is done by coincidence. Up until now, it's never rained, right, inside Scripture. The Bible clearly says that there was a mist mist that was coming up from the ground in order to water the ground. But I want to point your attention to this. It says in verse 5, it says, And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord had uh, had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was, uh, sorry, not upon the earth, uh, and there was, not a man to till the ground. It says, but there was a mist, there went up a mist from the earth 
and watered the whole face of the ground. So there's a purpose of everything. Everything that was in there was growing and flourishing and producing, I would imagine, fruit in a perfect way. But there was a perfect mist that was coming out from the middle of the, from the earth and watering everything in a perfect way. But one thing I want to point your attention to also is that in verse 5, towards the end of the verse, it says, and there was no, there was not a man to till the ground. Now, this is in chapter 2, and in chapter 3, man falls into sin. So my question to you, I'm going to take you to junior church real quick. So what came first? Work? Or the curse? Work. We always associate it because it says that we would have to sweat, use the sweat off our brow, right? As, as men. But the curse was that. It wasn't work. Work was already associated with just being a human being. There was no, there had to be somebody that kept up the garden that pick the fruit, all this different stuff, right? So man, man was created after work was already kind of planned out. Let's make it even more simple. Did God work for six days and rest on the seventh? Why wouldn't man work then? Why do we want to associate work with the curse it's good for a man to work. You exercise. You push yourself to the limit. And that all of that is good for growth mentally, physically. You will never grow muscle if you never push your muscles to the limit. You will never grow if you're never being active. So, we see that work was not a part of the curse. But we also see that God created trees in the midst of the garden in verse 9 for pleasure and food. It says, and out of the ground uh, made the Lord God to grow every tree and, uh, that is pleasant in, uh, to the sight and good for food. And the tree of, uh, of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We know that these are two very popular trees that we talk about a lot in Sunday school or talk a lot about in junior church. And, and, um, but God makes a point here about the trees that he planted were good to look upon, for pleasure to look at, and also for food, for us to, new, uh, to get, receive some type of nutrients inside of our body. That was the purpose of the trees. Now, I believe that God has lessons inside of creation for us to observe. And that's why we're going to look at trees and learn a very basic lesson from the trees. Now, God's answer for life here in chapter 2 of Genesis, his answer for life for man was on a tree. And even now. If we, if we can see in the midst of the garden, there was two trees that we, can, we know about. We know about the tree of life, which if any man were to eat of, he would basically have life eternal. And then you have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which was a tree of, what's the opposite of life? Death, which is a, a life of spiritual death. Now, isn't it crazy when we start thinking about that, that in chapter 2 of Genesis, that you see that Scripture is pointing out and emphasizing two things. There was life on a tree and death on a tree here in Genesis chapter 2. But do you realize that if you study that out a little bit farther into Scripture when Jesus Christ came, that death to life was also found on a tree in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ? Man's death came from eating off of the wrong tree. But man's life could have come also from eating off of a tree. Now, God uses these patterns in Scripture in several places. 
That's why he allowed Jesus Christ to be sacrificed also on a tree. A resemblance of showing a picture where a man fell and lost communication, or not communication, but communion with God, and where that communion with God is now being restored was also found on a tree on Calvary. Talk about depth, but there's several different things. If you go out and you start studying out Scripture, you see that le several lessons are found on trees. You see that Jesus Christ went to a fig tree out of season. Let's make a point of that. Out of season, goes out and tries to pick the figs, and there was no figs. What does God do? What does Christ do? He curses it, and it withers away. But it was out of season. But Christ wanted to make a point that we should always be producing fruit. Also, there is the parable of the fig tree where we are grafted in, in Matthew 24. We're grafted into, that's the church being grafted into this, this, uh, this uh, fig tree. We're not replacing the children of Israel. We are grafted in to you can go back and study out Genesis chapter 12, seeing where, uh, uh, where, that, where that was made with, uh, with Abraham. I'm not going to focus in on too much on that. But there's several different lessons that happen with trees inside of the Bible. Now, one thing I would like to point out to you real quick is just very simple and very basic, just the anatomy of a tree, because trees in the Bible sometimes resemble Christians. Christians sometimes are pictured as trees. If you go back, and, I, and, I, and I'm just, just popping in my mind right now, so I'll just mention it. The blind man, when Jesus Christ puts the, 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 the mud on his eyes, and he, the first thing that he sees, he says, what do you see? He says, I see men walking as trees. There's several different things. So the spiritual analogy also is that our spiritual life is like a tree. We talk about growing, but what are we growing? What's going on with that? Christianity is sometimes compared to trees or vines or something that grows along those lines. So I would like to share with you some stuff. We're going to talk about the anatomy of a tree real quick. Um, there is uh, uh, three parts, three main parts of a tree. There's the canopy, which is the, the leaves, the branches, all that, uh, the fruit, all that. That's part of the canopy of the tree. And then you have the trunk, which is the core of it, which is the main structure of it. And then you have the roots, which is underneath the ground. That is what is scattered out underneath the ground in order to maintain the foundation of that tree. Now, we can also see in John chapter 15 that Christ points out that he is the vine and we are the branches, okay? If you go back and you look at a vine, vine is very similar to a tree to where it has branches, has leaves, it grows out, produces fruit, things like that. So it's in the same category, but we have to look at, oh, I want to point out just two parts of a tree in a very basic way. Remember, I preached the junior church for five years, so I try to break everything down in a very, very basic, basic way. It's not that I'm trying to talk under you, but I'm just trying to make things simple so that we all grasp what's going on. There are two sections you, I would say two main sections if we're looking at a tree. You have what's above the ground, and you have what's beneath the ground. And I believe when, as Christians, sometimes uh, or just as human beings, sometimes when we're looking at a tree, we go outside and you're sitting on your front porch and sipping a cup of coffee and you look out and you see your maple tree. That maple tree can be, you know, 14 feet high, 10 feet high, and you're just looking at it and you're like, wow, what a beautiful tree. And you're uh, admiring this tree because of its leaves and how big it is and, and how strong you believe it is and, and how long it's been there. But as applying that to a Christian's walk, sometimes we realize that, that we are observing Christians sometimes on just what's above the ground and never what's beneath the ground. And the same way that happens with trees is what we see with our naked eyes, just, we just see just 
what's above the ground and how tall it is and how strong we think it is and how it produces fruit and how many leaves it has. And when we apply that into our Christian walk, sometimes we look at Christians, other Christians that are around us, and we say, wow, they're a really good Christian. They are very strong. They're very tall. They're, they have produced a lot of leaves. They've been in ministry for a long period of time. But my question to you is what's more important when it comes down to a tree? What you see above the ground or what is beneath the ground? What the reality is what is beneath the ground. I mean, we've had some really bad winds up here in Ohio recently. And those winds, I've seen them uproot some big trees. And when you see those trees being uprooted, you're like, man, they didn't have a big root ball at all. They were very tall. They were very wide. But yet they were very shallow when it came down to their structure, what their foundation is. And in reality, that's kind of what happens inside of the Christian life. We can show up with the nice suit, the nice tie, the nice smell. We can act, walk like we know Bible. We can carry our Bible. We can do all these different things, wear our skirts down to the ankles. We can, wear, we can do everything the right way as every single Christian should do. But that's just the upward appearance of what's above the ground and not what's beneath the ground. We know that we slack on reading our Bible and how our prayer life is. We know that we're probably not outreaching souls the way we should. We know that we are not doing and living our lives in the best testimony possible. We, so that, that's what's more important. If I just throw that out there pretty blank. But as Christians, as we observe other Christians, sometimes we just sometimes become in awe because they got everything together. They got it right. But you don't know their struggles. You don't know where they're falling short. And I will be honest with you tonight. If you think that you are grown as a Christian, you probably stopped growing a long time ago. If you have all the answers in the Christian walk, then you're probably not walking anymore. The reality is, as Christians, we should never be content with how much we are growing. I've seen some small trees that have some deep roots. I've seen trees that are horrible looking up on the top, but their tree structure or their, their root structure is very solid and strong. And I'd just like to share that with you tonight on just a basic lesson from the trees. Now, We see the tree, tree, the limbs and the leaves and all that, and yes, that is there for the pleasure, but we need to not always look at what's just the pretty part of the tree. We need to look at what's fundamental to the tree, and that's the roots. Now, if we put um, that into perspective into Christianity, there, uh, there are the two parts. There's the, 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 the outward appearance and the inward appearance, and if we go to 1 Samuel 16, chapter 9, you have to go there. I'll read it to you. It says, but the Lord said unto Samuel, this is when Samuel's going to ordain David as king. And he's at the house of Jesse and every one of, of the boys are coming through. And Samuel's like, which one is it, God? And God points out something to Samuel in verse Seven, it says, but the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on the countenance nor on the height of his stature because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. The Lord is... When he observes us as a tree, what he looks at is where our root is located, where our roots, how deep they are, how we're truly growing, where our nutrients is coming from. What's going on with the root system, the heart system? God looketh upon the heart. It doesn't matter how strong, how tall people think you are. It doesn't matter how you smell, how you Present yourself inside of church. 
What's important is what's on the heart before God. I have seen Christians that come into church and are fairly new at being saved and they want to tell everybody about Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ has done for them. And on the contrary, I've seen people be in church for 40 years and they show up and they're like, I got to do this again this week. Who do you think roots are? One is growing. Who do you think's roots are trying to pull nutrients from the Lord? Now, this is where everything started to pop off for me. <laughs> and uh, I've never seen it until recently, uh, two weeks ago, to be specific. Psalms chapter 1. Psalms chapter 1. That's where we're going to spend the rest of our time. Very, very common verse, I mean, a common chapter. I mean, if, if you've been in church any length of time, you've heard a message preached out of here. If you've ever been in junior church growing up in church, you have memorized this chapter. Very much a foundational chapter. It says, verse 1, it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his, in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a, what? Tree planted, uh, planted by the rivers of water and bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaves also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Put that into the context of what we have already talked about up until now. Realizing us being as trees in the image here planted by this river of water. Crazy, because I've never actually absorbed all of this until recently. It says that we are like trees planted by the river. When we bring all this information from Psalms chapter 1 into the light of Genesis chapters 2, when we start seeing the analogy of what happens with trees, we start getting a little bit more clear perspective of, uh, of Psalms chapter 1. But I want to point something out to you very clearly. In verse 2, the very basic form is, it says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Number one, for us to be able to grow as Christians, we should be delighting, we should be happy in the law of the Lord. We should be yearning, we should be excited to do something for the Lord. We should be excited to receive nutrients from God, uh, from His book. We should be happy to spend as much time as we can with the Lord whenever we can. Our delight, our happiness comes from God. That's where our growth comes from. We should truly understand that if we don't have the word of God, then we're not growing and we're, honestly, if we're not being fed from the word of God, we shouldn't even be happy. Happiness comes from seeking out God's face. Don't you get excited every single time you hear what God has done for you and with salvation and how much he's blessed you? But when you stop focusing on those things and you focus on your problems, it's usually when depression starts to set in, when uncontentment starts to set in. If you read through the Bible, you will see the blessing, the promises, how much God loves you. That should be a motivation for us to continue to grow and to continue to seek out God. The roots placed close to the continuous flow of water, and we see that in verse 3. It says, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in his season. His leaf, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now, if we go back and we truly study out that being planted, our roots need to be solidly embedded into the ground. And the Bible clearly says here that we are planted 
by the rivers of waters. Now, if you go out and you start an analyzing this, who is the living water? Perfect. You can see that in John, 3, uh, John 7, 37 through 9. Jesus is the living water. He is a continuous flow of nutrients that should be passing by us and, 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 and giving us the nutrients that we need on a daily basis, continual flow. You know, there's an analogy of, you know, we can have our sin, uh, just, not our sin, but we can have basically, um, I'm, trying, I'm trying to think on how to explain this. We can basically just continue to fill ourselves up with filth, but if there's a constant water flow through what that, 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 that container is, then the filth can't build up. It's like running water through a dirty cup. Pretty soon if you just continue to let the water run through the cup, the dirtiness is going to flow on out. So if we're struggling with certain things in our lives, we need to be finding our happiness inside of the Word of God and getting ourselves close enough to God in order to have that continual flow of living water that's coming through us in order to clean us out from any dirtiness that we may do or say. I understand our sins are forgiven, but we need to understand that we're not going to be sinless in this world, but we can try to sin less. And that only happens if there is a continual communication with the Lord. Whether that be through reading His Scripture, whether that be through going to Him in prayer, but there has to be a constant flow of water and nutrients that's coming through our root system. And our root system is where our heart is at. We should be placed close to the flow of the water. We should also see in verse 3 in the mid part of it, it says, that bringeth forth fruit in his season. Fruit, we have to understand, is a reproduction process that happens from the fruit, from, from the tree. The fruit carries the seed. So we should be producing fruit from our tree that we are as Christians. And I would say the best way to put that into a Christian perspective in a very basic perspective is through discipleship. Reproducing yourself. Showing other people what it is to be a Christian. But here's this. The Bible clearly says that I'm the vine, you're the branches. What produces the fruit? It's the branches. It carries the fruit, holds the fruit, produces the fruit. Ready? But you have to have that constant flow coming in from the root system, coming up through the vine, coming up through the trunk, going into the branches in order to produce the fruit. But here's this. The fruit is never for the tree. The fruit is always for something or somebody else. When we get to heaven, we're going to cast down our crowns. The fruit that we have produced is not for us, not for a pat on our back. It's not for us to say, you're such a good Christian. It's for us to lay down at the feet of the Lord and say, this is everything I've been able to produce for your honor and for your glory. We should be bringing out fruit in our season Ready? In our season, breaking it down should be in our lifetime. We have a season from when we're born until we die. You can't produce fruit after your death. So we should be producing fruit during our time, during our season of life. That's why Jesus Christ wanted to point out that fig tree because we should be producing fruit all the time. We shouldn't be stagnant and not 
finding fruit anytime the Lord wants to come in and check into our leaves and say, where's that fruit at? Are we bearing fruit or are we not bearing fruit? Are we doing something with our lives or are we stagnant? But also, if we look in verse 3 in the latter part of it, it says, and, and, uh, and his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Leaves are there for the protection of the tree. It's there for shade for people. Leaves are there for the purpose of, one, just to make it look beautiful too. But when we look at the leaves, the protection it gives to the tree so it doesn't get direct sunlight to where it burns the tree, is that's how our guards should be up as Christians. We should be finding our delight and our happiness inside of the Word of God. We should be having nutrients continuously flow into our root system, but then we should have our protections up in order for us to truly be effective while we're producing fruit. If we become completely vulnerable during the time of need of protection, then that tree is going to die off pretty quick. The fruit won't last. It will be burnt by the sun. As Christians, our protection should be up, but our protection is found in the Lord. Our protection is found inside of the Word of God and behind prayer and seeking God's face. This happens only, ready? All of this happens only if our roots are planted where they should be and us separated from sin. You know, we see that our happiness comes from the Bible, from the law. We also see that we should be planted close to the Lord in order to get nutrients. We also see that we should be producing fruit for the Lord. We also see that we should have protection up in order for us to be able to produce fruit, in order for us to be able to be effective for the Lord. But that only happens if we're separating ourselves from sin. You can clearly see that in verse chapter in verse 1. It says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law, and his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit. Uh, his fruit in his season, his, li- his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The way we prosper is if we were separate, if we separate ourselves and make a difference in our lives to say, I do not want to be sitting with the scornful. I do not want to be in, uh, in the counsel of the ungodly. I do not want to be associated with sin. What I'm going to do, I'm going to separate myself and come out of the midst of them and come before God and say, God, I want to be happy with you. I want to find my delight and my happiness close to you. I want you to nurture me through your holy word. I want you to continue to allow me to grow. The thing is, is that this only happens if we truly are serious about this. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. We need to get to the point where we stop examining people just on because of their, their super high structure and how powerful we think they are and how strong they are because they have amazing leaves and how tall they may be. But I'm sorry, Christian, to let you know, I have seen some very tall trees, but they're hollow. I've seen some very beautiful, luxurious trees that have leaves all around, but they have zero roots. And that's what happens sometimes in the Christian walk is that we're so stuck on how a person looks, how a person smells, that we forget that God looks upon the heart and the heart is what is most important to God. And the only way it becomes useful to God is that if we separate ourselves from sin and we want to be nurtured by God and we want to be used of God in order to produce fruit from Him and that happens if we have our protections up 
And that's where true growth comes. We need to be un, unrootable. We need to be planted by the living water, which is Jesus Christ himself. I want to draw your attention as we close out here into Colossians. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. It says, As ye have therefore received Jesus Christ as, uh, sorry, as Jesus Christ, uh, Christ Jesus the Lord, uh, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in faith, as ye have been taught abounding therein with thanksgiving. We will never get to the point of us truly growing, separating ourselves from sin, if we never truly acknowledge what God has done for us through thankfulness. We need to acknowledge that God made a way for us to come out of sin, has made a way for us to spend eternity in heaven, that, and, and, and that he has forgiven all of our sins that he has blessed us every single day from the breath that we take to the money in our pockets to the job that we have. When you get to that point, you understand what God means to you in the good times and in the bad because God is good in both. You will never know how strong you truly are if you've never felt how weak you have been. You will never know how powerful God is until you get to the end of yourself. We have to get to the point, Christians, that we acknowledge that we are as trees planted somewhere. The question is, where are we planted? Are we planted in this world, separated from the true water? Have, are we doing our own thing? Or are we truly planted by the creek by the river. Growing and flourishing, not just on the top, smelling good, looking good, but that our roots are truly grounded and being nourished. Are we separating ourselves from sin and not sitting in the seat of the scornful or standing among the ungodly? Are we truly thankful that we are peculiar people and that God has separated us for a reason. God clearly wanted to point out that man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. Your roots are what are most important. It's not about the tie. It's not about the coat. It's not about the shoes. It's about the heart. My question to you is, how are we rooted today? Where do our roots lie? Close to God? Being nurtured by God? Are we producing fruit the way we should? Do we have our protections up the way we should? Are we separated from sin? Do, are we thankful for what God has done? These are things that make a difference in a Christian's life. Not what is flaunted before man. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I would just like to ask you tonight if I would have the pianist come up and play too. Just like to ask you tonight, there's a basic lesson from the trees. How are we doing, Christian, with what we are producing, how we are being Nurtured. How are we doing with separating ourselves from sin? I understand it's a constant battle. But we can always work on it to be more effective Christians for him. Dear Holy Father, we come to you tonight and so grateful for your blessings, God. We thank you for just allowing us to see the basics and what uh, 
what a tree is and how it compares to Christianity. Are we growing? Are we stagnant? Are we truly being nurtured the way we should, God? Are we rooted in you? Or are we doing our own thing? God, I come to you right now and ask that you would please work through this invitation. Father, is there somebody in here that doesn't know that they're on their way to heaven, that tonight would be the night that they would get that right? God, I come to you right now and ask you to please work. Work in this invitation.